morning uh, to people at uh, different parts of the world. Uh, it's a wonderful opportunity for all of us to hear uh, Professor Leslie while give her a talk today. We are also very happy to have with us uh, uh, Mr. Satinda, Dr. Satinder Singh Reiki and Professor Manas Mandal uh, who always uh, join us uh, uh, on these uh, wonderful occasions. And we will request each one of them to speak very briefly and share a few quick observations before we introduce the speaker and start this talk. Over to Ricky, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Priyo. Thank you very much. Uh, for me to join Leslie's session is a pleasure. I have heard her before and she, she is very good. She has the knack of making difficult things simple. And she explains it beautifully, and her presentations are generally very, very high quality. She has a wonderful book, uh, and uh, which is Laugh Your Way to Happiness, I think. That's what her book is. And I believe she also has a laughter club, where she provides the laughing sessions, and that, prov that provides healing. I, I wonder during this COVID times if you're able to keep up the laughter sessions, uh, but it's it's wonderful. All the work that you're doing, congratulations. And thank you very much for uh, agreeing to give our students and our faculty members here IIT Kharagpur some time of yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, may I now request uh, Professor Mandal, who is uh, our advisor to the center, and uh, uh, always with us to say, say, say a few words before we introduce our speaker and start with the session. Uh, good morning from Pennsylvania. I'm here at uh, US. So uh, good to see you uh, back after a couple of years. I still remember your talk and um, you have been so gracious to help us all through these years. And uh, I'm sure your wow. virtual presence or wow. your presence in person will help us in a big way to run the center more and more effectively and more and more scientifically. In fact, uh, the practice of uh, having happiness as a center um, is uh, something we are looking for. And surely you, Dr. Chetri, would uh, help us in getting the students into the practice of or the art of happiness. Thank you, Leslie. We are eager to listen to you and uh, let us begin the session. Thank you very much, sir. It's uh, my honor to uh, introduce uh, Professor Leslie Lyle, uh, whom we know at the center for more than three years. And uh, we have very fond memories of her visiting our institute and our center in 2018 during our last international uh, conference uh, and uh, we look forward to a time when uh, she can again come back and spend some precious time with us. Leslie Lyle is a positive psychology practitioner, researcher and a 
clinical hypnotherapist with a passion for sharing the science of well-being, an associate lecturer on the Master Applied Positive Psychological Course (MAP), she runs a well-being clinic in the New Forest, UK. Currently, she is collaborating with Dr. Pius Wood, another author in the states, to develop teaching context for an existential positivist psychology course. In 2011, Leslie was trained in the practice of laughter yoga by the founder, Dr. Madan Kataria, and he has awarded her with the title Laughter Ambassador in recognition of her competence and dedication to promote laughter as well-being practice and running a free community laughter. As uh, Rekhi Sar pointed out, her book Laugh Your Way to Happiness, uh, published by Watkins. Describes her own experience of laughing for no reason and shares the science that explains why sustained laughter has a profound effect on well-being. So we will not stand between the speaker and the audience. Over to Leslie to start to talk. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Very generous introduction, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be connected with you again and to be here today. So, the subject of my talk is going to be reflection on attainable happiness, and we'll look at how we define and measure happiness, look at positive psychology interventions. How happiness is affected by our actions, emotions and thoughts, and happiness in challenging times, and then some questions. So you've really described my background very well, but just to briefly go over it, I, I did for many years work for British Airways and I was cabin crew, and um, during that time my roles were also training and recruitment, and lastly, well-being, as my interest in that grew. For the last few years of working for British Airways, I was part-time and I used that time to study various things. And my journey took me, first of all, looking at NLP, Neuro Linguistic Programming, which gave me that sort of interest in how the unconscious mind works. And I enrolled on a degree course of clinical hypnosis at St. Mary's University. And it was while it was there that I first heard the words positive psychology which was described as the science of happiness. And that intrigue and curiosity led to me being able to join the very first cohort of the Masters Applied Positive Psychology at Buckinghamshire New University. And it was while I was on that course, as has been mentioned before, that I learned, uh, travelled to work with Dr. Katari and learn about laughter. And yes, it's coming up to, just coming up to our 10th year anniversary of laughter. Uh, the laughter sessions that I run, some of which we've had to do online during the COVID, uh, some we've been able to do outside, but they've, they've continued to go and supported us all. When I um, graduated from the... I fortunate to be invited to stay on as an associate lecturer, and with a colleague, I began a company doing... Um, training and consultations in positive psychology, which we were very lucky to travel around the world doing, although of course COVID has changed that immensely. I also started a website called The Positive Psychology People. Now we've got over 71,000 people following that now. Um, I've got links to all these things I mentioned at the end of my slides. And that's a great place if you're interested in positive psychology to read some really interesting articles about how it can be applied in everyday life, um, written by a variety of people, some of whom have done the course and others who are just interested in it. And currently, um, again, as being mentioned, I've been very lucky to be invited to write two chapters in a new book, uh, which is about an existential perspective on positive psychology and in particular how it affects us across the lifespan and I'm also delighted to be um, the UK ambassador for the World 
Happiness Summit, which meets every year. And again, I've got a link to that. So my background might be a bit unusual and varied, but what it all has in common is that it's about people and how we're all connected. Even though we're all so very, very different, we're all so extremely similar. And that fascinates me and continues to motivate my studies in those areas. So I'm just, oh dear me, sorry, going back. So one of the first questions I had when I studied positive psychology is, how on earth can you measure happiness? And the answer I got to that was, well, actually, you measure it in exactly the same way that we measure depression. You basically ask people and people self-report how they feel. And in addition to that, there are also studies and there are some uh, questionnaires and um, scales that can be used. So in positive psychology, we look at happiness. Perhaps you feel that happiness shouldn't be the number one priority in life and that there are other more important things. You might think that concentrating on your happiness is selfish and self-indulgent. Priority then. I think all of us are entitled to feel happy. And what activities make you feel happy? Now, in the introduction, it was said that I could make complicated things simple. I wish that was true when it came to technology, not one of my strong points. But what I'd like to do is try and do a live poll so that we can all put in the words, three words of things that make us happy. So if you have a mobile phone available and you can scan the QR code, it would take you to a place where we can do that. Or you can just go to the website, www.menti.com, M-E-N-T-I, and use this code, 319739. So I'm going to leave that up for a little while, uh, while hopefully you're able to connect with that. I should have perhaps given you warning of this. But it would be really interesting to see what sort of activities you do that give you happiness. So here's the, the poll and already some people are putting in words. So we've got cooking, fishing, family, walking. Hopefully some more will come up. We'll give it a few minutes. Uh, we can always come back to it. But it would be very nice to find out what you think. Ah, here we go, reading. So here's one of the ways that we're all similar. We all like things and doing things, but we're all different because we have different ways of bringing happiness to ourselves. So I think I'll come back to this. Hopefully you can do this as, as we progress through the slides and it will stay live for some time. What I'd like you to think about as you put in your actions, things that make you feel happy, is what sort of happiness is it? Is it hedonic, eudaimonic, or chaironic? Well, excuse me, Leslie, um, are you presenting your slides or are you just speaking without presenting? Um, I'm presenting my slides. Are you seeing my slides? No. Oh, right. See what I said about... Um, Right, I might you can just share it now. Yes, yeah, sorry, I, th I, I thought you were seeing this. I should have checked at the beginning. So let's see. Is that better? Yes, we see that. Okay, so um, I think I'll continue, but I'll, I'll share with you. Um, let me share with you. No, sorry, I'm going to continue. Sorry about that. I should have, I told you I wasn't very good at, at tech stuff. So here, I'm going to quickly go through the slides that you haven't seen.
which should make sense with what I've said. And this is the, the QR code and the code I was talking about. So I'll just leave that up for, for a little bit and we can come back to it. So if you get the opportunity to go to menti.com and use that code 31955739 or you can use the QR code that's here. So maybe I'll come back in a couple of minutes but continue with the presentation now. And thank you, Sandu, for pointing that out. Otherwise, I would have gone through the whole thing. No worries. <laughs> so happiness, then. It seems to me that some people don't think about it very often. And I suspect that people don't think about it very often because they are already happy people. Maybe it's like science has taught us about people that are actively chasing happiness is that they tend to look for it. Places. The butterfly, it seems just when you think you've found where happiness is and it's within a hand's reach, suddenly it disappears and it's gone and you have to focus the new place that that butterfly has settled. But research also shows us that often when you're not chasing happiness but you're doing something else, happiness comes and settles on you. So it's as if happiness is a sort of side effect of doing something else. That happiness isn't a place, a destination. Happiness is a process. And so the simple way is to work out what the process, what are the things that make you happy, and simply do them. So do you want to be happy or happier? Now, the question might sound as though there's not much difference between the two, but I think it is, and I think it changes the way we think about happiness. You see, if you want to be happy and you start looking for where happy exists, where it is, you can go off course. But if you recognize that you already have happiness and you'd like to be a little happier, things become a lot easier, more attainable. And even if you increase your happiness by 1% or 2%, you'll succeed. But I think it's that change of attitude towards happiness that makes such a difference. The other thing is that you can read a lot of books about happiness. You may have already done so. But until and unless you put that theory into practice, it won't make you any happier. It will just make you an expert in the theory. Maybe you already know how to play the piano. If you do, think back to your very first piano lesson, how difficult it was, and how you progressed over time. Did it get easier? Did there come a stage where suddenly it was like your fingers had learnt a new muscle memory and things that you struggled with now become easier? And this is the way I think the happiness, uh, learning about happiness is. And if you were playing the piano, what was it like when you didn't practice for a few weeks or months? That's the attitude I think that we need with happiness. It's something that we need to practice. Very often people talk about happiness like a glass of water and depending on whether they think you're an optimist or a pessimist, it depends how you see the glass as being half full or half empty. If you think of the glass of water, the water being a container for your happiness, it will go up and down daily and over time there will be good days hopefully there'll be days where your glass overflows with water but what is very important and often overlooked is that you need to replenish and refresh that glass you can't just keep drinking it up and expecting to still have it and the way we do this is by the way we think 
the way we feel and the things that we do. And if we're lucky, these become habitual. So we don't have to do them with lots of motivation and self-control. They just become a way of living. And positive psychology interventions are based upon the science that shows what's common in people who are already happy, their characteristics and their habits, the things that they do regularly. And the theory is that if it works for them, it will probably work for us. And in actual fact, we find that most of the time it works for most people. So if you're interested in doing positive psychology interventions, I highly recommend the book by Sonia Lyabomirsky called The How of Happiness, which has all sorts of interventions that you can try just to see how they work for you and whether it's practices that you want to keep up. And that you are a good fit and that you are choosing something that you're likely to enjoy doing and therefore likely to keep up. And she even goes as far as sharing a personal activity fit so you can see what's best suited for you. But also she points out that even herself, she didn't fancy doing gratitude exercises she didn't think that they would suit her. But eventually, she did, and she tried it, and she found that actually her thought about it was incorrect, and it really worked for her. So sometimes you need to stretch yourself and try something that you don't necessarily think is going to be easy. So you're probably very familiar with your comfort zone. Hopefully you're in yours now. I, by the way, am outside of mine. But if you stay too long in your comfort zone, you can find that life can become boring and repetitive and feel stale. And if you want to grow and learn things and develop, you need from time to time to come outside of that comfort zone into what's called your stretch zone. Now, it's in your stretch zone that you will find the ability to learn new things where curiosity is and how you can change and reach your potential and it can be a very exciting place it can also be a bit scary and you shouldn't be there too long you can go back to your comfort zone what you don't want to do though is go beyond that stretch zone and go into what we call panic zone where you won't learn anything and you'll just feel awful Eventually, with practice, that stretch zone will do what we think it does. It actually stretches so that you and your world around you becomes bigger as you learn more and, and develop more. So, do you think that a pencil could make you happy? Well, you could probably come up with some creative ways to think about how that could work. But what I'm talking about is a study. And the study shows that if you put a pencil in your mouth like this between your teeth, it will improve the positive mood that you're in. What happened in the research is that they asked people to hold a pencil like this and look at cartoons, funny cartoons, and people with the pencil like this found those cartoons to be much funnier than those people who held a pencil in their hand. Now, the hypothesis of this is that the way you put your mouth, the muscles that are engaged in holding that pencil are the same ones that are stimulated when we're smiling and laughing, and that affects how you feel. But what's important to know is how to do it. Because the research also showed that if you hold the pencil in your mouth like this first photograph, it will make you find things less funny than even the person holding the pencil. And again, following that hypothesis, that's probably because it's pushing your mouth and stimulating the muscles associated with literally being down in the mouth, feeling miserable. And the picture on the right shows us what I would say was a sulky pouty sort of face. 
So it's very important to do it properly. And I think it's also important because it tells us that what we do without thinking about it, what we do with our body informs how we feel. And it's very much linked to, as was mentioned before, the, the laughter exercises that I do with people. Because when you start laughing as an exercise, it informs your body. So there's this two-way process going on. And it might make you wonder and think about the things you do and your posture that you have in everyday tasks. Are you doing things that are sending a message that you're feeling a little bit depressed? And most importantly, can you improve how you feel just by changing your posture? And there's quite a few studies, again, I've got links to them, that suggest that this definitely is the case. Again, the thing about laughter is that it's infectious. You know, we have things called mirror neurons. When we're with people and a group of people like this and people are laughing and smiling, you can't help but react. So one simple way to feel happier is to be with happy people. They'll lift you up. Of all the positive psychology interventions that have been done, the most successful have been around the subject of gratitude. It seems that most happy people express gratitude and appreciation. And the theory is, well, the hypothesis was, well, maybe if we do the same, we'll feel happier. And studies show that that indeed is the case. One popular and very successful intervention is to write a gratitude letter. It's a letter that you write expressing your appreciation to somebody who's had a positive impact on your life. Now, I've seen this have incredible results and been very life-changing on occasions for people. But again, the point is, it's not so much what you're doing here, but how it makes you feel. You know, when I was a child, before the internet, before text messaging, I had to write thank you letters at Christmas and my birthday to aunts and uncles and people that had bought presents for me. I probably did dozens maybe into the 20s. It feels like I wrote thousands of them. And I can definitely tell you that at not one time did I have a positive emotion during that experience. So writing a letter, just thinking, oh, just write a quick letter and it will make you happy, won't work. You need to be authentic and it needs to be coming from the heart and you need to feel it. Now, I think, I think we might just pop back and see if that um, word cloud that we had before has is, is worked and uh, just look at some of the things that make you happy. And uh, here it is. So we've got, oh, so, oh, lots of things coming up now. And you'll see that the more people have the same choice, the, the bigger the, the words are. So reading and music and walking are definitely common amongst you as a group. But there's lots of things in here. And these are things that you're identifying make you happy. So my question is, when did you last do them? How often did you do them? I once was on a, a training course in the um, Middle East and a gentleman shared that he, he wrote down riding his motorbike gave him more happiness than anything. But then he realised he hadn't actually been on his motorbike and had that experience for about 15 years. And so as a consequence of that, he went out and bought a motorbike and it made him very happy. Now, I hope I'm not going to cause you that much expense, but that you might read a bit more often or make sure you do it regularly. Um, and there's, there's lots of a, a variety of things here. The other thing is have a look and see which are eudaimonic, which are hedonic, and which are chaironic. I can see all three. Maybe we'll go back to this again at the end and see if there's any more in there. So my own um, 
And by the way, I think what I would say is if you take anything that you enjoy doing and put it into Google and add the word happiness, you will probably come up with a study that's been done to show that that particular thing causes happiness. So keep doing it. My own uh, thing was taking photographs of my phone when I was out during the day. And I share these on Instagram. So if you want to have a look, uh, leslie.lyle. And sharing them on Instagram means that I can access them whenever I like. Um, and I'm going to share a few with you. So first of all, um, it's said as a joke, but it's probably true that on my phone, I have about 14 photographs of my partner from last year and about 23 of my dog from last week. Um, Molly, who is featured very heavily in my photographs, um, I got her after I came out after a major operation. And she, without me knowing it, instantly became my therapist and my fitness coach. So I've gone out every day on long walks with her, which has got me fit. And she's taught me a lot about where I live. I've discovered new places. I've seen what the nature's like day by day, whereas before I only used to go out when it was a nice day. Um, and she's taught me more about unconditional love and companionship than I would ever have learned in a book. My other photographs are friends and family. And of course, when you look at these uh, photographs, you'll, you'll just see that, a photograph. But for me, I see a whole story, a whole memory. Um, it brings back lots of positive em emotions. It reminds me of things that I might otherwise have forgotten. So a great way for me to feel happy at any time is just to flip through these photographs on my phone. And my other photographs tend to be about nature. As I say, noticing how things change, noticing the small things, it gives me a lot of happiness. And I'm sure that you would find something similar, if not taking photographs of nature, photographs of buildings or insects, or just doing some of the things you've mentioned before. Um, so here we are then. So we're basically so far said, you know, life's a bowl of cherries, there's quite a few things. All you need to do is think things, do things, feel things, and you'll be happy. And then the obvious question is, what happens when everything goes really wrong? And I'm afraid to say that it will, and that we literally never know what is around the corner. So here's me two years ago, not knowing that was a big monster around the corner for me, and that monster, in my case, was, was colon cancer. And it meant that I had to have surgery and treatment. But the first thing I learned was a quote from a little bear called Winnie the Pooh that said, you are braver than you believe, smarter than you seem, and stronger than you think. And I know that to be true for me. And I know that to be true for all of us. When it comes to the big things in life, the big challenges, we get through. And to be honest, we don't have a choice anyway. What I found useful, and I still try to live by it, I don't always manage it, but I try to live in a little golden bubble. And it's a bubble of things that are within my control. Because I noticed that my worries and the things that bothered me and kept me awake at night were all about things I had no control over whatsoever. And my worrying just made me feel worse. They didn't change anything. So I try not to worry about the past. I definitely can't change that. The future, I've no control over that. The weather, I can't change. Accidents, what people think of me, all of these things. And instead, focus my attention to the people I'm with, the things that I say, whether I sleep properly or eat properly, um, 
and I would recommend that you have your own little bubble and you do something similar, if not in, a, in an actual graph, but in your, in your mind. When you feel stressed and worried about things, you, you take your attention back to what you can control. And of course, whoever could have predicted what happened to the whole world and has probably affected every single person in it, and that was COVID-19. And of course, it's, it's affected us all, some more than others. But even during this, there are things we can do to help other people and to help ourselves. And I'd like to recommend that you read an article that's um, being published and written by my good friends and colleagues, Dr. Piersworth and Dr. Matthew Smith. And it's called Clearing the Pathways to Transcendence. And it's how we can support our well-being and resilience in the context of COVID-19 and other challenging situations. Um, there's a link to it, it's free online and you can read the whole article. But did you know there's another virus that you can get, another contagion called the happiness contagion? Because science has shown that happiness can spread just like a virus does in social context and by up to three degrees of separation. So if you become happy or happier, you'll affect people who will affect other people who will affect other people. And people that you've never met, who've never heard of you, can actually become happier because you've become happier. It's amazing, isn't it? And so I would suggest that you make sure you get infected by happiness and that you spread that too. And again, back to laughter and smiling. You know, we don't always feel like laughing and smiling, but I would guarantee that if you were to sit at this table with these people, you wouldn't be able to help but become affected by their positivity and you would feel a bit better at the very least. Our mirror neurons make sure that we, we do that. We, we can't help but have empathy for the moods of other people. So another great way, if you haven't got the energy, if you feel down, you can't do a positive psychology intervention, just make sure that you're with happy people. And going back to that glass, imagining that that is your happiness. You can't practice for the big unknown things that are going to happen in, in life. But I guarantee that even, perhaps even just today, you've been annoyed or irritated by something. It might be losing your keys or a noisy neighbour or being late or somebody else being late. All those little things that if you're not careful can steal your happiness, can cause you to spill or waste drops of that. So I would say practice resilience. If you're somebody that gets annoyed driving the car, before you set off, make that intention to, to be patient, to be kind, to let people in, not to be affected. And fill your glass, focus on the things through your thoughts, what you do, how you feel, how you think, and fill that glass up. Drink in all the happiness that you can, there will always be people happier than you. There will always be people unhappier than you. But if you can live every day as happy as you can be, given all those circumstances, then you'll be reaching your happiness potential. And none of us can ask any more than that. So there are some references. if you want to know more and some resources that you can and links that you can find and we can go to questions and perhaps you'd like me to stop sharing my screen i'm not sure <coughs>
Um, may I go first with a question? Yes, of course. Thank you, thank you so much. I mean, it was it's just a wonderful presentation, and uh, I, I I validate what I said. You presenting so simply, and in your slides you show pictures, and many of them don't have any verbiage, and and it's explained so beautifully. Uh, I'm very grateful that I got a chance to uh, to attend this session of yours. And my question is: This morning I was talking with uh, Professor Mandel and Professor Patnaik, and we are discussing this situation. And you mentioned about the COVID situation, and uh, we were talking this some frustration. And the term that was used was languishing. And Professor Mandel said that languishing is depression without sadness. It's kind of an emptiness, and it's kind of a new thing, a block. So, any thoughts on how we uh, how we can get out of this uh, languishing state and get into a lactulistic? Thank you. I have one question, please. Yes, of course. It's not a question. The other day, a month back, actually, it's not a question. The other day, a month back, actually, I was talking to Professor Ligman in his house, ah. and. Um, question that why some people are perpetually depressed i mean you try to make them happy in many different ways they are never become so he brought a concept which aaron tebeck also brought primal belief he said that, that, that there are people whom you should ask only two questions one question is whether the world is good or bad and the second question is whether the world is safe or unsafe. Wow. You will get to understand that whether depression, sadness, unhappiness is hard word in them or not. So you have to have a different intervention strategy for them as compared to a that the world is good, but there are incidences which made me feel bad. So this is one concept. Uh, he was talking about that uh, this primal belief also has a uh, role to play who is going to ultimately becoming happy or unhappy because as I could understand it's not a choice had it been a choice why so many people have been unhappy that's number one number so so of course intervention will help how does it help I had a similar question once again to Martin. He said that you go to Starbucks coffee shop, a cup of coffee, you'll get a good cup of coffee with the froth on the top of cappuccino. But some people are happy seeing the froth. <laughs> but some people are happy seeing the 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 coffee beneath. That is the the actual taste of coffee is not in the froth. You have to go down in order to uh, get the test of it. Mm. So the the actual happiness probably is somewhere down the line. But as you said, laughter actually at least makes us happy, uh, at least at the at the surface level. And many people have the tendency to go deeper, and as a result of which, they have become happy. But some people, we fail to make it. So what Dr. Rick, he has been saying that uh, why some people get depressed, even if you uh, do not have any problem, probably I find a link because by having, I'm not trying to be critical, by having laughter in your thought process, we are trying to do some kind of reverse engineering in the brain, isn't it? some kind of reverse engineering in the brain because we are aware of the fact which muscles ultimately bring your happiness the dopamine release so if you activate those even electronically through electrodes mm -hmm. through electromyograph you still feel happy the question is the technique should be rather than trying to only help them happy how to sustain it so the sustenance must come from the trigger of laughing. Mm -hmm. So, through laughter, it's a trigger. So, how best we can use this trigger depends on my interventional technique. We can use that interventional technique properly, then probably the intervention would be 
more than just an intervention, it becomes a therapy as well. Mm -hmm. That's what is the point of view I wanted to put forward. If you have to be, uh, if you have to say something, please. Mm. Well, first of all, you've spoken to um, the person who would really know this inside out, and that is um, Professor Martin Seligman. Um, and I like, I like the analogy, I like the, the froth on the copy. Next time I have a cappuccino, I will remember your words. Um, mm. And of course, um, Professor Seligman um, has done a lot of work on learned optimism, and also yes. which stems from his, his work on learned helplessness. So I yes, think yes. The, the key things in what you say are, um, first of all, responsibility. I think we have to take responsibility for our happiness, and some people aren't prepared to do that. They, they feel that, as she was saying, that life is unfair and that this is their, their lot. And we can't make anybody happy. I mean, you know, we can help those who want to help themselves, but we can't, we can't stick a pencil in their mouth all the time or, or make them do things. And, and then just finally, from my personal perspective, um, you know, there's a difference between taking somebody from languishing into um, helping guide them to things that would hopefully make them flourish and people who are clinically depressed because often there needs to be a, 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 a more serious um, pharmacological intervention for, for that. But um, I, I hope Professor Sullivan writes some more because that sounds very, very interesting and I, and I do agree with what you're saying. Actually, he's writing another book and uh, we are in the process actually, he's writing another book. Oh, good. On that. Anyway, okay. uh, we'll get more chance because other people should also get chance. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. We do have a few questions. Um, there's also a hand that's been ra uh, raised by a Putinese participant. Please wait for a moment because there are others earlier than you. So one question that comes from Silpi Maurya is what can we do if we did not find happiness in anything we are doing right now? And I think Professor Manas did answer somewhere, but I lost that track. So if you just want to um, answer this. Um, if somebody is not finding happiness in anything that they do, perhaps I, I, I would tend to wonder whether they are thinking of happiness in a, in a, a very sophisticated way or because nearly everything we do is motivated by happiness. You know, when we go to work, if we, if we break it down, we might not enjoy our work, but we go to work because presumably, even if we don't enjoy the job, we get some money. And, and when you break it down, what, why do people want the money? Because they look after their family. So I would think that, that happiness, even if it's not from the things we do, it would come from somewhere in life, from the, pe uh, the people that we love and love us, or you know, our pets or nature. If somebody's not getting any pleasure from of any type or any happiness, um, I, I'd be concerned for them. So I hope that I've misunderstood the question. Uh, Marissa, if you want to add? Uh, 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 for me, I mean, it's a personal experience because some people uh, don't find happiness. So I've just uh, put it in the chat box. Uh, create happiness for others. Be within the ambience of others who are other becoming who are otherwise becoming happy you will see them you will reciprocate them and they will become happy so creating happiness is actually uh, what you said in the beginning is actually a process it's not a destination destination is i want to be happy if i look for destination i'll lose the process if i make it myself as the target then the process would be lost so if it is a journey or if it is a destination that distinction has to be made. Mm. My view is that, well, let it be process. You also said that. Let it not be uh, a target. Let it be a journey only. And then we'll continue to become happy. Otherwise, we'll try to derive through a financial accounting that how much happy I could become through that process of activity. So if I'm not getting happiness, just create happiness for others. You are doing it for the pet. 
and you are becoming happy in the process. So I think uh, your word cloud, the technique that you have used is called word cloud. Yes. I mean, yeah, there is a software these days to create those word clouds and you will get to know what makes you happy. Many a time it so happen that we don't understand what makes us happy. So nothing, you do not have to do anything. For the day, whatever you speak, put it in the software, you get a word cloud, see which one is coming in the forefront. Simply do that. It becomes uh, a happy way of living. Um, if you're looking for something that makes you happy, uh, an activity, think back to what you did as a child. Because okay. in my experience, whatever you did as a child that you enjoyed, you still will. Um, the thing is that we grow up and we tend to think that these things are childish. One technique I, I've tried with people, and they laugh when I ask them to do it, is I, I say to, to grown-up adults, just spend... 30 seconds skipping you know instead of walking skip and it's amazing how you you it brings you back to being a child and feel feeling carefree again it goes back to what our body's expressing um and you can remember being being a child uh, if you can get somebody to chase you i know it sounds ridiculous even better so that you're screaming and running away because in that moment you forget everything it's a very mindful exciting fun experience that will remind you of, of what you what you used to feel like when you were carefree and uh, a child. Thank you, Leslie. That should really help. Add, I just want to add one little thing. Leslie, you had said something about gratitude and writing a letter of gratitude. So if someone is not finding happiness in any activity, let him make the effort or her make the effort of finding some things to be grateful for. That probably may trigger a little bit of uh, yes. happiness. And, and uh, I would add, uh, sorry, uh, if I sorry. just add to the so, Sorry, Leslie, on the same line, there is a question. Let me put that first and then you answer. Yeah. Is there a way to motivate someone to practice positive psychology activities like gratitude journal? Many times people start, then lose track. What do we do then? Yes. So on the same gratitude note. Yes. People I'm get uh, demotivated. How can we continuously make them motivated? Yes. Well, I think my answer to the previous or comment on the previous thing and this may be uh, linked because if you if you don't feel gratitude, if it, it's not naturally coming to you, it's quite a good thing to start thinking about the absence of things because once you contemplate life without something it makes you appreciate that you have it it can be from you know for example doesn't work very well imagining what it would be like if you didn't have a car when your partner annoys you and uh, you're cross with them imagine if you didn't have them same goes for your children um, thinking about people that deliver our food or just having hot water in a shower any of these things and also appreciating that many people don't have them how lucky and fortunate we are, because sometimes we can get tied up in all the things we haven't got and, and forget the things that we have. Um, and, and then to, to the losing um, motivation to keep doing it, uh, yes, that, that, is, that would be a problem if you were always writing a gratitude diary. In fact, they recommend that you don't do it every day, that you do it a few times a week. But the thing is, once in my experience, Anyway, once you start to notice things and appreciate them, you can't help but notice them. It's it's not it's like um, if you've heard of the reticular activating system. It's the same thing that if you I keep going on about cars, I don't know why, but say you bought a, or you were thinking of buying a red car, you'll suddenly notice red cars everywhere. When you practice gratitude, even for a short time, you, you even though you might consciously stop unconsciously you still get that information how beautiful that tree is or that plant or how kind that person was and it, it becomes something that that your unconscious mind produces for you in my experience thank you uh, thank you Leslie I hope uh, Nira you got the answer but there are several questions so uh, I will now allow the Bhutanese guy to ask a very short question, please. 
Thank you. Hello. Am Mr. Pokhran, yes. Uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. Well, thank you, Leslie. I think uh, we met in the happiness conference back in 2018 and it's nice to hear you speak again. I just wanted to ask you that uh, somewhere down the line, I got the sense that happiness is living in the present, but uh, subconsciously we are all working for the future, such as even pursuing education. You know, we are looking towards financial security and we are trying to attain visions. So does pursuing happiness mean that we have to strike a bargain with the visions or the larger purpose in our life? Thank you. Thank you for that question. Um, can I ask you what you think before I answer? Well, I feel that, you know, even though I'm, I always try to get myself into living in the present, I also am working towards my future. So I have a mechanism of, you know, counting the things that really matter to me, like cutting down on things that I can do and I cannot do or I can control and cannot control. So that's my way out of it. But I just wanted to know your opinions. Yes, well, I, I think that, that there's a balance, isn't there? I think future goals are important and we can't, although it's, it's good to live in the now in some respect, it would be uh, irresponsible not to plan for the future. So I think it's a matter of getting a balance, you know, so um not putting off a lot of people do put happiness off to a future event so they say i'll be happy when I, when I retire or I'll be happy when i get married or i'll be happy when this that and the other happens um and forget that actual happiness is is very much a now experience you can only you can anticipate it in the future and you can remember it in the past but you're only actually experiencing it in the moment so I think having those long-term and short-term goals, you know, I, I'm going to work hard and save up for this, but at the same time, I'm going to make sure that I also have time for my family and time for myself. And I think self-care comes in, into this a lot that you, you know, it's, it's a bit sophisticated, really. You're trying to balance all these different things. But I, th I think that, that that is perhaps the answer. I, I don't know what the perfect answer is, but trying to get things in balance so that you're and, and that you're getting your hedonic happiness but also that you demonic which will be sort of your goal um to goals would be linked to that thank you thank you leslie uh thank you so much um we are limited with time so i don't know how many questions i can ask there are so many coming on to my phone uh, there is one from ankur who says that happiness relies heavily on channelizing our internal mind and also is affected by our external environment. Uh, and his question is, um, if the external environment is completely negative, how from affecting our inner happiness? A difficult question, um, because that, that's a real challenge, isn't it? Um, we are very much affected by our environment and lots of research, you know, talking about people just commuting to work can be uh, have a, a negative effect on your happiness. I, I think um, I would only say you can only do what you can do. You know, that the things that are sometimes outside our control are our environment, you know, choose where we live um, or I, I presume that, you, you, that that was the question was around that. Um, do what we can do, you know, protect ourselves from things that we, we know have a negative of things that, that have a positive. And learn strategies, you know, I think um, planning, um, preparing, realising uh, w what the challenges are and, and working around them the best we can. Because, you know, at the end of the day, we don't have the benefit of saying, well, oh, I'll live here, I'll do this job that I'll love. You know, sometimes we're, we're locked into things that, that are difficult. But I, th I think if you can find meaning, if you can't find the right environment, and perhaps in your job might be a bad environment, but if you can find the meaning and the purpose of why you're doing it, which might be your family and the things that you love and protecting them, that will give you a, a, a feeling of more agency, I think, and may help. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Maybe at the end, I'll ask Professor Manas to give a few of his thoughts on these questions that have been arising. Um, there's one from Aratikra uh, Trika, 
she says respected respected madam when faced with sudden challenges difficulties or even minor problems how do we cope with them is a question of coping that we are confronted with so many problems every day how do we cope up i think that's the question she is asking yes um yes and we um, we are as i say in my experience we're far more resilient than we think we are I would say practicing resilience because it is a skill it is something that you can learn and it helps you where where things bounce off you rather than uh make you feel helpless um and, and that would be a skill that would be well worth um developing for that um learned optimism which we sort of mentioned um Professor Seligman talks about how we can be more optimistic realistically optimistic um developing the skill sets you need to manage these challenges i wish there was a, a really simple answer the best you can with the circumstances that you're in and with the resources that you have um and developing those personal resources is is a good investment it certainly has helped me i i can tell you you know having been through a challenging health um uh, I don't like to use the word crisis but perhaps that's how it started to feel is that you 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 learn a lot about what works and what doesn't and it's and then you get stronger and you get better at dealing with things it's the little things like losing your car keys the little things that trip us up I think so but they are golden opportunities to to practice you know to say now normally I'd be very cross at this but I'm going to try breathing or I'm going to laugh at it which is if you can do that that's the best of all just find it funny even if you don't find it funny laugh as though it was funny and you'll notice that you you feel a lot better thank you lesdin there's one if we have to live a hedonic lifestyle for a long time what could be the result out of it I think you'd be yeah I think this happens to quite a few people um that um you know these happinesses that we we put into three categories um there isn't a hierarchy and there isn't one that's better than the other although professor salomon says if it's a choice between hedonic and eudaimonic eudaimonic will give you more meaning and purpose in life but you know some people work so hard that they forget to have the moments of pleasure so you could become a bit serious you could become that sort of person who goes on holiday and can't relax because you you're just zoned into work all the time um on the other hand if all your happiness comes from hedonic momentary um pleasures you might meet and purpose in life and you might feel a little lost and uh, li- life might feel less meaningful for you so it's it's making sure you you have a healthy dose of all and that um when it, as long as it's not hurting yourself or some uh, simple pleasures each day um but uh, that you're still in tune with the larger purpose in life and your values and how you live I'm aware that professor uh, patnaik and orchi has to leave in a little while so we will try to uh, wrap up soon in another Four to five minutes. The last question that I'm going to pick up is from Professor William Hunter. He says he asks how to know whether I'm happy person or not. Well, I think the answer to that is, are you happy? <laughs> and 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 that will change. You know, it's quite an interesting question. It sounds simple. Are you happy or not? Um, how do you judge your own happiness? That would be something for us all to reflect on. um are we ha- do we judge it on how we feel today or yesterday in general do we look at our life through time or in time and um generally i i think most of us have have an idea of how happy we are plus if you if you really want to do um online you can uh go online and find lots of um subjective happiness um questionnaires to fill in uh and you can um measure your positivity um positivity scale by Barbara Fredrickson and i believe that um that you can still do a free 
online survey and then track your positivity, which is another way of looking at happiness over time, because it will fluctuate, you know, and there's no way that any of us is going to get happy, whatever that would mean, and just stay there. You know, it's a fluctuating thing. And who would want to be happy all the time? How would, how would you know when, when it was a good day or a bad day? So an interesting one. How, how do you know you're happy? Well, I would just ask, on a scale of 1 to 10, how happy are you today? How happy are you in general? Thank you. Thank you so much, Leslie. Thank you. Uh, may I give uh, the floor for a minute each to Professor Manas Mandel and Dr. Eki? Before I conclude. I, I'll take that minute first. Right. I, I have a personal question to ask. I have a personal question to ask you, Leslie. Sure. You know, you said in your presentation that you were not well. You're looking quite good. I just want to hear if all is well and you're healthy. Thank you very much. And um, I am very well. I, um, I have to say that positive psychology was my best friend, apart from Molly, that she was afterwards, when I went through my health situation and I've recovered very well. And um, I've learned a lot. You know, I think that's the other thing to remember about challenges and adversity is that um, lots of people say I wouldn't wish it on anybody, but I feel that life is better. I'm more appreciative of my health and my family and the things that matter. So I think I'm actually in a better place. And, uh, and I feel very well. And thank you very much for that question. It's very kind. Good, Thank good, you. Uh, good seeing you. Last good, words good of wisdom you. to uh, Professor Manas Mandel. Thank you, Professor Dr. Rani, for your for your appreciation. And, yes, sir. Uh, please. Uh, uh, actually, uh, yeah. uh, I I became happy seeing you. Honestly speaking, and uh, just a simple question, more personalized to you: Is your lifestyle or is your coping style that make you happy? Uh, does your lifestyle and your coping style, yes, definitely, uh, how you live your life and how you handle, you know, I think it's not what happens to you that's as important is what you think it means and what you do as a consequence. So, for instance, just taking it to a personal level, um, when I was ill, um, did I think I was unlucky and poor old me or did I think I was lucky that I have so many people, I'm, I'm so grateful to, for the, the medical staff and the people that have helped me recover and the people that sent me wishes. And that was something that I, I can never emphasize enough that when I was poorly, the messages from people that came in saying that they sent me love and, and care uh, was the most healing experience I've ever had. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's funny, isn't it, that you can live through something and then that you would not wish on anybody and look back and say, well, wasn't that fantastic? What wonderful things came out of it? A bad day, yeah. I had, uh, Leslie, uh, you made me happy. <laughs> right. uh, you, I, think, I think you should let Professor Patnaik say the last word. Uh, yes, uh, Professor Patnaik, you could thank and then leave. He has a connectivity issue. I think so. So I, I think I will. He has come. Would you like to uh, propose the vote of thanks or say a few words before you want to leave? Sorry, uh, Sandhu, I, I lost everybody for a moment. Were you talking to me then? No, no. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, we are extremely happy to have Leslie. He has a connectivity issue. I can't listen. There's a connectivity issue. So, um, uh, someone, Ankur, can you just type uh, on the message that he could leave now because it's late? Right. 
So let me take the opportunity to uh, thank Leslie Lyle, our great friend. She brought a lot of happiness to all of us today. Um, 